today we're going to be talking a little bit about the kingdom of God. Uh, in essence, we're going to be talking about a clash of kingship. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew 21, and that's where we'll be. Um, But before we get there, I just got a couple of questions for you, because I want us to kind of picture what this clash is like. In life, we have clashes where two things come together, and they're at odds with each other. Things like, I don't know, MSU versus U of M, (laughs) um, Starbucks or Big B. If you're uh, in the NBA world, Michael or LeBron, Star Wars or Star Trek, whether you like the snow that's outside or you'd prefer it to be 80 degrees, Uh, pizza or pasta, I mean, we have all these debates over things. Which is the best, which is the best uh, season? Is it spring or fall, summer, winter? We have these clashes of ideas that people have. Uh, When I was a a teacher at a local uh, um, Christian school in Lansing, uh, I taught a debate class, was one of the classes I taught. And we'd have these times where we would pick, my students called them stupid debates. (laughs) I said it was good practice. Uh, But what we'd do is I'd pick a, a really weird topic like, why is the color red the best? And their goal was to have one side present, here's why it's the best, and then the other team would have to listen, think about what did they say, and how do I respond to their ideas? And they'd go back and forth in this clash of ideas to kind of see who would win. Um, And whenever you have this clash, whether it's in a stupid debate uh, like the ones I gave to my students, or maybe a a less stupid one of MSU versus U of M, uh, or whatever those debates are, when you come to the end of it, there is a resolution. You work through the pros and the cons, you make lists, you argue back and forth, and at the end you get to some sort of resolution. Sometimes it's good, like we'll agree to disagree. Sometimes not so good, where we hold a grudge against someone else. Or maybe it actually comes to fighting. And occasionally, if we are seeking out the heart of God, we will get to one of the best solutions where two people come together and they realize the validity of the other side and they have a change of heart. But this clash is inevitable. And this clash comes uh, in this section, what we're gonna talk about, in this idea of kingship. And it is really important uh, of why we need to make sure that this clash is, is kind of looked at. Because kingship is way bigger than we experience in America. We don't really understand in America what it's like to live under a king. We don't get that because we have a lot of rights. We have opinions. We can go out and protest. Like We can do these different things that state what I like without the repercussions of what a king can bring. In fact, the Bible gives us a really clear idea of what a king king can do. So before we jump into Matthew, let me just read to you a part from 1 Samuel 8. This part is where the Jews or the Israelites are asking for a king, and God says to Samuel, this is what you need to tell them. They want a king, here's what it means. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, he says, uh, kings will take your sons, Put them to use in his chariots, on his horses, or running in front of his chariots. He can appoint them for his use as commanders of thousands or commanders of fifties to plow his ground and reap his harvest, or to make his weapons of war, the equipment for his chariots. He can take your daughters to become uh, perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He can take your best fields, vineyards, and olive orchards and give them to his servants." He can take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give them to his officials and servants. He can take your male servants and your female servants, your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He can take a tenth of your flocks and, your, and you yourselves become his servants. You notice that these pronouns that keep coming up, he and his, everything is the king's. You really don't have an option If he wants it, he gets it. And we don't understand that. I don't understand that in America. Because even though there's been times in my life when I feel like 
Yeah, I've had a king over me in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it was my parents. Maybe it was a, 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 a boss or a coach. But ultimately, I also fall back on, I have my own opinion. I can say what I want, and maybe I can change their mind. But to a king, you're putting your life at risk by stating something different than him. So when we have this clash over kingships because a king literally has all power, absolute power over his kingdom, when we have this clash over kingship, it's a big deal because who you choose as king will dictate how your life goes. And so when we walk through Matthew chapter 21, I want us to look at um, at this idea of this clash. You see, there's a lot that goes on in Matthew chapter 21 and 22. We're not gonna be able to hit everything, uh, but what we're gonna see is kind of this, uh, this flow of a narrative of clash of kingship and what that looks like. But what I need you to remember as we come into this idea of kingship, we need to remember and have the overlying concept that Christ's kingship is different than what the world offers. That's where the clash is. You see, Christ, uh, in, in, a, in a world, a, a bad king destroys. A good king makes things at least semi-tolerable. But a truly loving king sacrifices himself for his people. And so we're going to see here a king that is sacrificing himself and calling us to do the same. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 21. Uh, We're going to start in verse 1 here. Matthew 21 starting in verse 1. And this is the the triumphal entry uh, of of Jesus coming into uh, into Jerusalem. Uh, Let's pull up the right verse here. So here we go. Matthew 21, verse 1 says, uh, Then they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say that the Lord needs them, and immediately he will send them. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their robes on them. He sat on them. A very large crowd spread their robes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who were followed uh, kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. He who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And so the first question that we need to ask is, did Jesus actually claim to be God, to be king? Because if he doesn't, then what we're talking about here doesn't make any sense. If he doesn't actually believe that he is God, that he is king, then we have no reason to follow him. And so when you look at this triumphal entry, uh, growing up I remember you know, all, these, all the visuals of the, uh, of the palm branches and, and maybe someone pretending to ride on a donkey when I was in Bible school class and stuff like that. Like I remember seeing all those things. But there's a part here that I didn't really catch Because in this entry, Jesus is making a strong declaration that he is king. You see, these parades into cities weren't something new. In fact, the Romans were really good at it. They were so good at it that they had these things called triumphs, where the the emperor or a a major general would win a huge battle And they had stipulations, like you had to kill so many people, you couldn't lose so many people, like all these stipulations. And then when they would come back to Rome, they would have this huge parade into the city, sometimes lasting days, celebrating this victorious person coming in, coming back home. 
And Jesus is coming into the city in a similar fashion, people cheering around him on a donkey. Not a horse, not something of, of great importance, but of, on a donkey. Although it is one that is never been used, one that is more honorable. And so you have this declaration of, okay, yes, I am someone important. And then when you look at this, Jesus says, or Matthew says that, um, reminds us of, of Zechariah. And in Zechariah, uh, it tells us that, uh, look, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey. Matthew quotes it. And in Zechariah uh, chapter 9, this part of Zechariah is saying, your king, the whole chapter is talking about the savior, the king is coming. This is how he's going to come. And Jesus comes in that exact same manner. This is not a coincidence. Jesus knows what he's doing. He is coming into Jerusalem and he is proclaiming, I am God, I am king. And that's hugely important. In fact, people are yelling to him. They're saying, Hosanna. They're praising him. Hosanna in the highest. And this word Hosanna has its roots in save us. The crowds are asking Jesus to save them. Save us, son of David. That's a term used for the Messiah. Jesus is making a strong, strong declaration in his entrance into the city that he is God. And we've got to accept that. The next part, we get into uh, the cleansing of the temple. And here, Jesus is, is doing it again. He's making a statement of, I mean, he's doing a lot of things, but part of our narrative, he's making the statement that he's God. He has the ability to come into God's house and say, this is not right, for whatever reason. He, gets to, he comes in, flips the tables, he, you know, tosses out everyone, uh, and some, some people say part of the reason he did this was because all this money thing was happening in the court of the Gentiles, which means there was no place really for them to worship, and Jesus said, hey, this is a house of prayer. All nations should be coming here, including the Gentiles. And then... He's talk, some other people talk about part of why he did this is a, just, not just a cleansing of the temple, but recognizing that the temple is not going to be used for religious purposes the same way it has been because he knows what's coming. He knows that he's going to the cross. He knows that that veil is going to be torn. He knows that people are going to be able to enter God's presence and sacrifices will not have to happen anymore. And so this cleansing of the temple very well could have been part of a foreshadowing of what's yet to come. The temple is not going to be used in the same way. And only God can make those declarations. And then you get this part uh, later in chapter, chapter 21, uh, in verse 14. You get this part where he heals people, and then he gets praises by kids, Kids are saying, Hosanna, son of David. Like, they're calling this stuff out. And the Pharisees step up and they're like, well, wait a second. Maybe he doesn't hear them. Now, honesty check. How many of us have ever done something like that? Maybe you are on a phone call and you don't really want to talk to the person, and so you pretend like you can't, I can't, we're going through, click. Or maybe it's my kids, and I tell them to do something, and they don't hear me, so they don't get in trouble when they do it anyway. Any of us ever done that in our life? <laughs> and so the Pharisees are like, well, maybe Jesus doesn't actually hear that, that the kids are calling for him, uh, to, you know, that he's king. Maybe he doesn't hear that. So they, they bluntly ask him, hey, Jesus, do you hear what these kids are saying? And Jesus just responds, Yes. He knows what they're talking about. He knows that they are calling him the Messiah, the King, and he's not denying it. He knows that this praise is due for him. And so we have Jesus coming on one side, claiming kingship. 
and then the, the Pharisees are on the other side, and, and they are about to kind of push back. And what we need to recognize as the Pharisees are pushing back, we need to give them just a little bit of grace. Because there's a lot of times in my life that I push back against Christ in the same way that they do. Question him, did you really mean that, Jesus? Do you really want me to go talk to them? Are you sure this is the job that I'm supposed to be doing? Do I have to pick up after my kids again? So the Pharisees are gonna come and there's gonna be a clash here. And so they come and they challenge Jesus. And they ask him a great, great question. Uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 21, uh, let, I wanna give you the question verbatim. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 23, here's what happens. The chief priests and the, the Pharisees say, uh, when he entered the temple complex in verse 23, the chief priests and elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching, and he said, they said, by what authority are you doing these things? And if there was a Pharisee peanut gallery, they'd be clapping, high-fiving, hooting and hollering, because this was a fantastic question. Because if Jesus answers that he's God, they've got him in their mind, to blaspheme. And they've got the crowds all there hearing it. They're thinking, we can stir up the crowds against Jesus. If we can just get him to specifically say these words, we've got him. And if he doesn't, if he says, my power is not from God, we've got all the crowds who have heard that too. And we can say, look, he's just a man like you. But Jesus doesn't respond in the way that they expect. Instead, Jesus turns the question on them. In essence, Jesus is saying, look, I'm not gonna play your game. We're not gonna rile up the crowd. We're not gonna try to put people against each other. Who gave John his authority? Who did he come from? And the Pharisees know they're stuck in the same spot now. If they say from God, then that means that, that uh, they should have listened to him and they didn't. If they say from men, now all the crowd is gonna be riled up against them. And so now they're stuck. And so they say, we don't know. And so then Jesus moves on and tells them this parable. And it's the parable of of the two sons. How many of you have heard this parable before of the two sons? This one, to me, is, is, is a little special because I grew up and I, I've got uh, four siblings and my parents would ask us to do things and sometimes we would do them, sometimes we wouldn't. I should have, but I, I didn't always. And sometimes they'd say, hey, will you do this? And I'd say yes, and then I wouldn't. And that's what this parable hits at says, but what do you think? A man had two sons. He went with the first and said, my son, go to work in the vineyard. And his son answered, I don't want to. Yet later changed his mind and went. Then the man went to the other and said the same thing. And the second son said, I will. But he did not go. Which of these two did the will of the father? The second And I don't know about you, but this part hits me today because there's a lot of times in my life that I've been challenged, specifically over this past year, to say, the Holy Spirit's challenged me and said, Joel, you say you trust me with your finances because I've shown up before in your life and taken care of you. You have a testimony of that and you've shared that with people, but why aren't you walking that out now? Maybe you're like me, where I wanna believe something in my head, and I'm like, yeah, I believe that, but when I actually get to acting on it, it doesn't happen. That's where the Pharisees were at. They said they believed God, they said that they read scriptures and they understood the scripture and they were able to, to tell the people what to do and things like that, but when it came to actually walking it out, they did that very poorly. 
where the the tax collectors and the, the prostitutes, the people who were unclean in their eyes, they saw Jesus and were like, man, we need him. I'll do whatever he asks. They were the ones who did the will of the Father. And then Jesus takes it another step further and he starts to lay out some consequences for not following in his kingship. So take a look with me at uh, Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 33. I'm not gonna have time to read through this whole section, but I wanna give you the, the gist of what's happening. You can kind of look it over. So basically here, there's a parable, and there's a man who has a vineyard, and he's renting it out to people. And so then when he sends his servants to collect what he is owed, the servants Some of them get beaten by the renters. Some of them, uh, none of them get anything. Some of them are beaten, some of them are killed, and and the, the owner of the vineyard doesn't receive what he is due. And so he says, you know what? Let me send my son. Let me send my son to them. They will surely respect my son. And instead, those people, the tenants, saw the son and they thought, this is the heir. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And so Jesus asked, what's gonna be done to these tenants? And the Pharisees are smart. They gave a great response. He will completely destroy those terrible men and he will lease his vineyard to other farmers. You got it. That's what's about to happen. And, then, and then I think when Jesus was telling them this, I don't think he was telling them it like I would. A slap in the face, I don't like you, I wanna write you off, you are no good to me. I don't think that's the love that Jesus had for them. When the Bible says that he wants all to come to know him. I think Jesus was laying out kind of a last straw. Look, I want you, I want you to be a part of my kingdom, but you're doing wrong. I'm gonna be blunt, but I'm loving you because I want you to come back. I want you to know what is about to happen because I want you to turn around. I think that's what Jesus was getting at here. Because then he lays out exactly what is going to happen. He says, Have you never heard or read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord and is wonderful in your eyes. Therefore, here's what's gonna happen. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing fruit. You see, the king requires his people to be working, to be living, to be following him. And if we're not, that kingdom is taken away. If we're not following the king, if we're not bending a knee to the king, then we're not a part of it. And Jesus, the the Pharisees knew he, he was talking to them. And then he takes it even one step further, and in chapter 22, he lays this wedding banquet. And the essence of this wedding banquet is person, a king is throwing a banquet for a wedding feast, and he invites all of these people, all these great people, and they all say no. And then he says, well, servants, go and and go find people who will come, the good people, the bad people, uh, the people that should be here, the people that shouldn't be here. Go ask everyone. And when those people show up, they come into the banquet. But one gets through without proper wedding clothes on. And the king looks at him and says, how dare you enter this place, this holy place, this celebration, how dare you come into here not bending your knee to what is expected? And he's cast out. You see, this is the, the consequence of not living for the king. This is the consequence of being cast out of of heaven, not being in our future. This is the consequence of, of not bowing our knee to who the king is. 
because I don't think this guy shows up at a banquet and is like, yeah, I didn't have anything. I'm pretty sure a loving king sees the person who has nothing and gives them what is needed to enter his presence. That's the Jesus that I read about. But I think this person walked into the banquet and said, I don't care what you have to say. I'm coming in my way. I'm sorry. You're not king. You don't get to make the rules. And for me, this is sobering. Like, this is a challenge to me to to think, am I living my life in such a way that is in honor of the king? You see, I have a daily clash of kingship in my life each and every day. What I want to do versus what Jesus has called me to do. What I believe is what is right for me in my future and what Jesus believes is right for me in my future. These things clash all the time, and I don't think I'm alone in this. I guess I should say I hope I'm not because that would make me feel really bad about myself. But I think we all have those clashes of kingship. Will I follow in who Jesus is? He has staked his claim as king. He has said, here are the consequences of what's going to happen as, if you don't follow me in a loving, blunt way that says, I want you with me, but I want you to know what the cost is if you don't. And man, it's hard every day for me to wake up and put my kingship aside and pull his and follow that every day. That's not easy. But it's the challenge that we have. And as our worship team comes up to to kind of uh, lead us in, in a final song, I want us to look at four challenges that Jesus lays out for us as we finish this, uh, this chapter. And the first challenge is this, and you can read through these uh, at your, on your leisure at your house, um, but the first challenge is this, uh, you have to come with a bended knee. If you're not gonna bend your knee to the king and enter the wedding banquet, then you're not gonna be able to be there. It starts with surrender. And the second challenge is you give to Caesar what is Caesar's and you give to God what is God's. And you know the biggest thing that is God's? It's my life. It's your life. That's what is God's. All this other stuff doesn't matter, but it's my life. That's what I need to give back to him. So I need to come with bended knee. I need to recognize that I'm giving God the things that are his, which is my life. Not just what I say, but what I do and how I act. And then we get to a point where Jesus repeats what was told to Moses in the Old Testament. He says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to really be who God wants you to be, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart your soul, your mind, your strength. With everything that you have, you love him. And then you let that love pour over into your neighbors. These are the challenges that I'm faced with daily. These are the challenges that you are faced with daily. And here's what is so cool about when I was studying this and looking at this for this specific time. Next week, we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus which is a fantastic and awesome time. And we do that every week, but this is a special time, a big celebration. We get to celebrate who and what Jesus is. But we can miss part of it. If we don't live this week recognizing the kingship that is a daily thing each and every moment, because he's our king, because his kingship reigns, because who he is, is what is best for his church. And so my challenge to you is this, lay aside your kingship. Lay aside the the things that you want, that you feel like you need, the, the desires of your heart, put those aside and let Christ fill you with his desires. 
Because the most, the most fulfilled time that you will have in your life is when you let Christ be able to lead you in his path. And so maybe today, part of that response is accepting Christ as your savior and you've never done that before. Maybe your response to the king uh, today is to say, I am going to purposefully follow what Christ says and not just say it. Whatever your response is to the king, you need to recognize that he requires a response of obedience if we want to have his fellowship.